Welcome to Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. Joyous conversations about what the afterlife evidence and modern science combine to tell us is true about our one reality. You have nothing to fear. You are eternal and you are perfectly loved. Knowing the truth changes everything. Now, here's Roberta. Welcome to Seek Reality. I'm Roberta Grimes and I'm delighted you're with us today. You know, one beautiful fact about the year 2020 is that humankind's vision of reality is at last becoming a great deal more accurate. Not universally and not right away, but the old beliefs-based scientific certainties, which are in fact not true, are not true at all, believe it or not, are joining a lot of the religious, religion-based certainties that also are not true. Both are fading as the 21st century continues, and that's good news. I've been talking about this on my blog of late, and some of our Seek Reality guests have been sharing with you just how much the old false certainties are finally fading away. Of course, one beneficiary of the fact that the old ideas are losing out at last is that evidence-based certainties are becoming more interesting to people. What is really true? And people who have graduated from the physical realm are able to tell us a lot more about reality than we could have learned in any other way. Most of those listening now have heard of spiritualism, which is a British and American spiritual movement based in England, but also now pretty common in this country, too. Um, it's, it's Christian but it's also very involved in communicating through mediums. And I've spoken in some spiritualist churches. They're lovely, lovely people. But far fewer people know about spiritism. This is a holistic philosophy based in the books of a French educator who wrote under the pen name of Alan Kardec. His books come compellingly close to some of what we've been learning about reality during this 20th century from thousands of beings who are not now in bodies. So... Spiritism has developed quite a bit. It's become a social movement of healing centers, charity institutions, hospitals involving millions of people in dozens of countries with the greatest number of spiritism's adherents living in Brazil. Now, as you know, I don't advocate for any religion, but I often hear from disaffected Christians who still feel the need for some kind of a religion. They don't want fear-based Christianity as it has been practiced, but... They want something, and spiritism for some people of that, of that type may fill the bill. Last fall, we spoke with Jasara Korngold. She's a third-generation spiritist from Brazil who's now living in New York. Lovely person. Jasara has been translating spiritist materials into English for the past three decades, and she's a leading proponent of spiritism in the United States. And she was going to be our guest this week. But um, she has she's she's actually in Brazil right now. She wasn't sure about her, her connection, so she has sent a wonderful substitute. This year's Spiritist Symposium will be held on June 6, 2020, in Berkeley, California. It's called Soul Searching in a Technological Era, with a subtitle of Evolution and Immortality. And this program actually looks like topics that would interest a lot of Seek Reality's listeners. We put a banner on the homepage of, of robertagrimes.com, so if you think that the Spiritist symposium might interest you you can learn more by clicking on that link I've just got to say the price is right and actually a lot of it looks very good now because Josara is in Brazil at the moment she has sent her colleague Daniel Assisi to speak with us about his own views of spiritism in the upcoming symposium Dr. Assisi is a founding member of the Spiritist Institute, and he's the current executive director of the California Spiritist Association. He's the host of the Spiritist Conversation podcast. He's also part of the Togetherness video series, which is an interfaith documentary on religious diversity and spirituality. His latest project is a book which is coming out later this year. It's about the Apostle Paul's personal transformation, which was profound, and the lessons we can take from it for our own lives. Daniel holds a doctorate's degree in education and a master's in public administration with a graduate certificate in public policy from the University of Southern California. So he's quite learned. Dan, I'm so glad you're with us. Welcome to Seek Reality. Thank you so much for having me, Roberta. It is a pleasure to be here talking to you um, and also, uh, you know, just learning more about spirituality in general. Yeah, we, we have fun talking about, about these topics. What I, one of the things I love about what I do is all the wonderful people I meet. So I'm, it's just a pleasure. Consider yourself hugged. 
And now, please tell us something about your own personal history, because most of the people who listen kind of like to know who it is they're hearing from. So, where are you from? How did you get involved in Spiritism? Tell us a little about yourself. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, and a, a virtual hug right back at you, Roberta. I am a hugger, <laughs> so consider yourself a hugger as well. Um, um, I, was, I was born and raised in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, from an early age, my parents were very interested in spirituality as well. So they were spiritists themselves. So I, I grew up in a household where, um, you know, the fear of death was perhaps not as high as uh, we generally have elsewhere. And uh, this idea of like, you know, the soul surviving uh, the death of the physical body uh, was, a, was a common reality and things that we talked about it. And in fact, I thought it was really interesting because I did not realize that that, that was not uh, commonplace until right. when I grew up. Right? Yes. Uh, yeah. It, it's, yes. It's, it's unfortunate. People who, and you were blessed to have that kind of upbringing, but people who have grown up always knowing about the, the truth about the fact that our lives continue forever are remarkably matter of fact about it. I, I have three children. They got this at home. And as a result, they're not that interested in any of this stuff because they already know it. It's like, ah, I learned that when I was a kid. So you were blessed. You were really blessed. So did you, you went into it as a profession then where you did you, how did you go from there? Yes. So, um, so it was a commonplace, like I said, you know, but I, I, you know, I was a kid and I just grew up as a normal teenager and so forth. Eventually, I made my way to the U.S. Uh, to come and uh, do, uh, to go to college, right? So uh, funny enough, when I got here to California, I've met my future wife uh, who came from Germany. And so uh, wow. California, yes, California ended up being neutral territory. So we decided to, <laughs> yes. to stay. Neutral is right. Well, that, so that, well, that's wonderful. So when did you come to this country? Oh, I was about 18 years of age. It was 1995. Um, okay, so and, you're an old timer here. Yeah, you know, it's a funny thing because, uh, I, you know, looking back, I have now spent uh, more time in the U.S. than I have in Brazil. Right. So uh, sometimes it leads me to question my own sense of identity, but I'm very happy and grateful to be there. You don't have to be in two countries to, to do that questioning. I think we all do but from time to time. But so did you then start to were there were, were there spiritist communities, churches uh, or what, whatever you call your gatherings? Were they were they already there when you got to California? There were very few, and we call them spiritist groups or spiritist centers. Uh, we try to break away from the idea of an organized religion uh, uh -huh. for many different reasons that we can talk about. Uh, uh -huh. But there were a couple. I was probably about 21 or 22 when I felt like, you know, something is missing in my life. I feel like I need to talk about greater things and greater perspectives. So um, I was reading a lot of books. We, we, we tend to focus a lot on reading and studying spiritism. Um, so those were great, but I was missing that community piece where you can talk to people about things, right? I was always yes. very curious about the dialogue piece. And, you know, you can always learn quite a bit talking to others. So I did look and find a, uh, um, a spiritist group in L.A., in Los Angeles, where I was living at the time. And, uh, you know, I went the same day. And from there on, it kind of it kind of filled that void that I was feeling for, for purpose and meaning. And it's been... Quite a, probably more time than I like to uh, to admit. It's been about 22, 23 years. Yeah, wow, that's good. And well, let, let's talk first about what spiritism is, and then we'll talk about if someone went to one of these groups, what they could expect. Sure. So um, spiritism is, as, as I like to define it, is, it's a body of knowledge. It's a body of knowledge that studies the nature the origin and the destiny or the, the end point of spirits in general and how spirits relate to the physical world, right? So it really has a DNA of inquiry and research and understanding who, who we are, like what we are, right? Where do we come from and where do we go? And it has what we sometimes call a triple aspect, right? So there is a focus on evidence-based uh, information, so the scientific part of it. There is a, a focus in reflection and thinking about things in general and how they come together, and that's the philosophical aspect of it. And he has an ethical part to it, too, because 
at the end of the day, if we are convinced that life goes on after the physical body, how does that change our behavior here in this world, right? So how do we behave? And uh, we call that uh, the ethical piece of it. Sometimes we call it the religious piece of it. Uh, If we understand religion as a connection to the divine, and not just organized religion, which I think sometimes people confuse for religion, right? It's it's not about necessarily the gathering of people and labels, but your personal relationship with something greater. So um, spiritism kind of brings it all together in that way. So uh, is that something greater? Do you call that something greater God or higher power? Or how do you define that the what, what, the, what the sort of source is? Great question, Roberta. Personally, we, we tend to call it God. Um, but we understand that people may have different levels of comfort with the word God because of their previous experiences. Yes. Uh, but, but we do, we do call it God. And every once in a while I joke around and say, if God does not fit you, uh, then just use G-O-D, right? Uh, as a <laughs> right. grand organizing dude or <laughs> oh, yes. whatever it has you. Like the name, the name is not as important as the essence, I think. Right, right. Um, I, I, I'm helping someone right now um, who can't stand the, name, the word God um, and actually can't stand talking about Jesus either. So we talk about Hashem because that's that is sort of a, a neutral Jewish word. It does. I don't think God cares cares what we call God, um, and I think Jesus feels the same way. But th- this all came out of the writings of Alan Kardec, right? Or it did. Yeah, I- with that? That's actually a great point. It, it, I would say that the writings of Kardec actually came from observation, right? So I think that the interesting story about Alain Kardec is that he was the editor-in-chief of this thing. Um, he put the books together, but he was explicitly told that he was not to use his name because that was not the result of his work. It was actually the collaboration of many different spirits and many different intelligences giving um, him the information to put it together. So he, he has a great role in putting it together. That's why we call him the codifier. That's somebody who put all these things into code or put it into a book. But, um, but we try to shy away from saying that this is uh, Kardec's work, right? He's, Isn't he's, that interesting? So he was the person who was alive at the time he was writing, right? He was in a he, body? Correct. He was. He was. And it's a funny and interesting story because um, you know, he was uh, living at a time in 1840s and 1850s uh, uh, France, Paris, the center of the learned world, so to speak. Uh-huh. Lots of different phenomena were taking place. And probably because people didn't have Netflix and TV, they would they would get together and they would do these uh, seances. Right. And yes. these, uh, these different things. And all of a sudden, these objects started to move around tables moving, right, table tipping and so forth. And clearly. Um, you know, there's there's something exceptional about that. It's oh, not an everyday, right. everyday piece, That's right. right? Um, <laughs> right. And so he he was not taking part in those at the time, but a lot of his friends, at, you know, uh, held him in high regard and asked him for his opinion. He he wasn't interested at first. Eventually, they 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 convinced him to do it, and and then he became fascinated by the phenomena because he clearly could tell that they were either a fraud. Or there was something else at play because right. tables and you know and chairs don't have nervous systems; they cannot move. Right, <laughs> right. And soon he found out that uh, um, you know it was that in fact uh, different forces or intelligences operating those tables on those chairs. And he has a wonderful sentence that I really enjoy. He says that you know every cause has an effect, and if the effect is an intelligent effect, then the cause must be intelligent too. Right. Um, and so if the chairs and tables were obeying commands and being able to understand words, and clearly it was not the chairs and tables, there were this intelligence behind them who were intelligent in themselves. Um, and from there, uh, we saw an evolution of that interaction. You know, first was tiptology, you know, knock three times for A. Uh, oh, you know, yes. knock. <laughs> right. Imagine how long that must have taken, right? Yes. Uh, but, and but actually, I, just, I, mean, yeah. I just tell everyone listening, this was going on also um, in the eastern United States and especially in southern yes. England, this phenomenon of people sitting in the dark and doing table tipping. So I, it's, I didn't know that's what this grew out of. Isn't that fascinating? All right, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, this is absolutely fascinating, Robert. I think you nailed it. And I think this is one of the beautiful things where we had the Fox Sisters happening in upstate yes. New York as well. Yes, um, yes. And- and it's one of the things that the spirits also tell us later on and that Kardec writes about. He talks about the universal control of the spirits, which is just a name. 
And he basically says uh, something which I think makes sense, that if something is true, right, it will be shown in different places to different people because yes. God would never have just a chosen few that he would prefer over others. So right. the truth has always been spoken at different times to different people. It's just whether we are willing and ready to listen. That's absolutely right. And what's interesting, too, is he is wor- – so he then was contacted by this collective – of, yes. of, of, of spiritual beings. One thing I want everyone listening to understand is that the more advanced spirits are, the more they tend to work as collectives. We have heard from some very advanced beings, and in every case that I can think of, they they said they were representing thousands of beings. But this is the first case I've heard of where th- those thousands of beings were using a living interpreter. So I, he, I, he's part of a fascinating phenomenon, which uh, which is actually a very relatively common, although most people are just not aware of it. So that's great. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's you're very right, Roberta. And I think what's really interesting about the way spiritism came to be is that once he understood something was going on, he employed his uh, scientific training, so to speak. And so he started to go into different places and asking different mediums the same questions. And he also asked for other people in other geographical locations to ask those same questions. Then he would gather all questions. What kinds of questions? Like, for example, for example, um, what is God? Where do we come from? And so um, and so he gathered all these questions and all these answers. If the answers match. And they come from different places. Yes. Then there's a high likelihood that they are correct. Absolutely right. right. Yes. And so, yes. Yep. And so, and so, what he does then, he puts it all together in that initial work that kind of launches Spiritism forward, which is called the Spirits Book. And so, in 1857, he publishes this work in Paris, which is a collection of, you know, about a thousand questions now. In the first edition, it was about 600, um, uh, where he tries to get his own perception out of the way by keeping it, um, you know, question and answer, basically, um, literally, right? He asks the question, and then he gives the spirit answers and so forth. So, he just has the, the, the work of organizing them in, the, in a way that it makes it easier for us to connect the dots and, and bring them all together. But uh, he tries to give us the primary source, so to speak. So, so how, how closely did these answers approximate one another when he gathered them? Say he had five, is that a normal number of five different uh, mediums who were asked a question? Where, did they give the same answer? Um, they generally came very close. Right. And as as a scientific process in general, too, right, you can start to assess your sources, too. Um, And so with time, he would also come to learn which of the mediums were more reliable mediums. as we all know. Right. So it's a triangulation process of trying to figure out where is it coming from? Is it really what it purposes to be and so forth? So it's a fascinating way of doing like an evidence based gathering of information for a spiritual purpose. Yeah, and I think it's a great thing. I've not heard of anyone doing that, and I think we should be doing it too. Um, it's a great way to test mediums, and it's a great way also to come to better understand what's going on. So you're right. It, it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a multifaceted test, which would give tremendous positive, necessary information at this point, it seems to be, in, in reality. The trouble is scientists won't consider doing anything as sensible as this. So, so – uh, then people began then to read his books and to – what happened next? Yes, they, um, people were interested and they began to read the books. And, um, and then he kind of kicked it in the higher, kicked it higher gear because uh, folks started to really think about, well, uh, it seems like we have proof that, you know, that uh, we outlive our physical bodies. Uh, then what does that mean? Right. So they started to philosophize about the whole piece and then try to think about the ethical implications of of that. So they would gather in groups uh, in the spiritist uh, societies in Paris and have these debates and also continue to practice and study mediumship. Because the second work uh, that Kardec brought to us was the mediums book, which was the first treatise, I think. Uh, ever written about uh, mediumship and how to actually study and uh, practice it. Uh, And I think that's a very cool aspect to spiritism because having gathered the original information, uh, Kardec was also keen to tell people how they could get it themselves, right? So it was really an an effort to kind of democratize information because until then, if you think about it, in the history of humanity, 
mediumship was a very veiled and secret thing that you would yes. only learn through apprenticeship, right? It was a, 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 a kind of like a special thing to do, but with that new knowledge in our hands, uh, then anybody can understand how mediumship works and kind of demystify the whole idea of a medium, right? As yes. a special being an entity. That's, that that's, sense. that's yeah, it does. It does make sense. So um, the, these then groups would gather. What what is if, if someone listening says, "Hey, this sounds interesting. I want to sort of investigate it." Maybe they live in Los Angeles or someplace, or they just look it up in a in a in a in the. Um, I was almost said a phone book. You can hear it. Hear me yep. giving my age at that point. They they'll look online and find a spiritist group. What would it be like to go to a spiritist group? What, are they pretty standardized in what they do, or is it different in each area? No, they are not standardized, and that's the beauty of it and the really hard part of it, too. Uh, <laughs> right, I'm sure. Because, yeah. Yes, yes, because we, you know, the, the whole thing about spiritism is to try to make it as flat and not hierarchical as possible. Uh, you know, if we look back in our history, I think that we always struggle with organized religion when we try to institutionalize it, right? Oh, it goes. Yes. You go sideways. So we try to shy away from that. So in spiritism, you're not going to find priests. You're not going to find preachers. You're not going to find um, hierarchical structures. You are going to find, you know, in a group for practical purposes, like a director of the group or president of the group, because at the end of the day, you need to make something happen. But there is no clergy. There is no structure. Right. And there's a respect of free will, right? So it's very possible that when you go to a group, it may be very different than another one. Uh, but generally, what you would see is you generally see either a study group t- uh, going on or some sort of talk about a specific, uh, you know, uh, topic in general. And generally, it would be something regard, you know, related to um, uh, to Christianity and interpretation of that, and how to how to live an ethical life and how to apply that to our lives. Um, there will be also some study groups for folks who want to learn more about um, uh, spiritism in general. Uh, and also mediumship. So there will be some mediumship classes as well. But those are uh, and of course, we uh, the groups would also have mediumistic meetings where they actually uh, do a group effort in talking to and counseling spirits. Uh, a lot of the work that spiritists do is to actually counsel those who have passed away and who are unaware that they have done so or who are struggling to understanding uh, what's happening and what's next for them. So, so it's kind of a unique thing. Work. Are you they do. That is great because absolutely the, yes. The need for that is tremendous. Oh, that's wonderful. All right, so I, these are things I didn't know when I spoke with Jasara. We we talked in more general terms, but it, I'm glad to kind of get down to the nuts and bolts like this. So, you, you mentioned Christianity. Is would you say this is a variation of Christianity, or how does Christianity relate to Spiritism? Well, it's a great question and one that uh, um, perhaps is a. A tough thing to 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 answer, but I, I definitely say the spiritism is Christian in the sense that it uh, tries to study and accepts the Christ as the best uh, model for ethical living. However, it's we understand that it's not the only model, right? But in that early in that early uh, research that Kardec did, one of the questions that he posed to the light spirits is, what is the best model that humanity has had for ethical living? And the answer was Jesus. Yes. Um, and so he, be, he began to to kind of reevaluate the whole idea of Christianity and go back and understand different things. And um, and I think a lot of spiritists go through that as well. When they become interested in spiritism, we kind of go back and start looking at all the things that we have learned about uh, Jesus and Christianity in general. And, but since we now know about the immortality of the soul and reincarnation, which is another important part of spiritism as well. Right, um, right. We see the teachings of Christ very differently. Well, maybe not so differently, but definitely not um, not dogmatic as sometimes it's meant to be. So I would definitely say that uh, spiritists hold Christ in the utmost highest regard, but it's perhaps not the Christ that we have been given yes. uh, by history and culture. Right. Yes, that, it, exactly. Uh, that Well, that's... Um, so far, everything you've said is the same kind of thing that I've learned doing totally independent research. So um, I, I'm very, uh, I'm very impressed with what you're doing. Um, so you, you, you don't teach fear, then you don't teach uh, negativity. Jesus had to die for your sins. Look how awful you are. That's not something you would teach. No, it's not. Um, you know, when <laughs> I when I look at the life of the Christ, I think that the one resounding message that I take away is the fact that he. He came back, right? 
to yes. show to us that he survived death of the physical body. For me, yes. that's the biggest takeaway. So I, yes. right? That's it good is. news. That's, the gospel means good news, and that is and the that's ultimate the good best news. Best news. That's exactly right? right. There is no such thing as death. What could be better news than that? Oh, I just think this is great. Yeah, yeah. and I struggle a little bit, Roberta. Actually, I, I, I also struggle. I think like you do. That I don't know why people, you know. Um, remain focused on this idea of a Jesus suffering in the cross. I think that it's antithetical to everything that he came to teach us. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> there was a, a 20th century, mid 20th century um, comedian who said that uh, if Jesus died now, uh, all the little Catholic children would be wearing little tiny electric chairs around their necks, which <laughs> I don't know why, but it just strikes me as completely sensible. I, uh, it's completely you know, normal that that's what's happening. But horrifying at the same time. I mean, it kind of cuts right to the to the core of the nonsense this, that this is. So, um, I'm I'm just very glad that uh, spiritism is there. It's a, this is. We, I've been spending my whole life working independently and getting really put pretty much to the same place you are. So I think this is great. What is it you're going to do at your symposium? Let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, so so this symposium is an event that we do here in the U.S. every year. And it's a rotating event, so it goes to different cities every year. And this is the one time a year where different spiritists come together to talk about uh, different topics. Uh, and there will be some talks. Uh, there will be an opportunity to kind of meet and greet and make new friends. Uh, there will be a couple of roundtable discussions uh, and conversations in general. So it's a it's kind of like a culminating event and a, and a chance to to uh, you know investigate a specific topic or a series of topics through the spiritist lens, if that makes sense. What, what, what is the spiritist lens? Is it, I, I mean, here's the, I guess here's the, to me, the key question. Are there dogmas? Are there things, the, like a list of, these are the things we believe, so that you would be looking, for example, at a, a, a electronic communication or, or some communication-related phenomenon with regard mm-hmm. to the people who aren't here with us. But saying we believe this, we don't believe that, or is this mainly an investigative process? No, that's a great question, Roberta. It's it's spiritism by definition cannot be dogmatic, right? The uh-huh. uh, spiritism, so spiritism's DNA is one of inquiry and science, right? Yes. To the point of Kardec said, if one day science proves any of this wrong, then let go of this and embrace yes. that, right? Yes. Yes, um, exactly. And I, yeah, and I think that's a, the dynamic approach that we need for our new days, right? Oftentimes, we have these congealed forms of thinking that they refuse to update themselves. And I think that uh, uh, spiritism is, uh, tries to do exactly the opposite, is trying to gather new knowledge and, and move forward with the times. Because, you know, it's hard to make sense of the modern world just with old information, right? So um, so by no means does spiritism carry any dogmas whatsoever. Uh, we personally might, Right. Uh, I think that's important to make a distinction that sometimes spiritists themselves still carry their own dogmas, but it's no reflection of spiritism them, itself, uh, because oftentimes we have our own hangups individually, right? Um, of course, of course. But no, but yeah, but no, absolutely. Uh, I think the interesting thing about spiritism, like we are not opposed to any kind of investigation whatsoever, whether it's EVP, whether it's you know uh, uh, spontaneous memories from previous lives, or yes. or or uh, regression, or uh, obviously mediumship, or uh, what have you, right? There's many different ways of us skinning the same cat, so to speak, to use a horrible metaphor. Um, <laughs> well, well, um, I, I, uh, that's exactly what I had gotten or gathered from Jasara, but we just touched on that. So it, it's very important then for people who might be thinking, or might just be curious, is this the kind of thing that, because there is no place now. I would stress this to people. The things we talk about, we, we every week we're hearing from people on Seek Reality who are making wonderful, cutting-edge um, discoveries in this field. More and more we're coming to understand what reality actually is. But uh-huh. there is, as yet, no place to go to talk about that. And so what you're saying is that spiritism is open to talking about the whole range of reality, what, what's actually going on, and that's what it's about? Indeed, indeed. It's, it's a whole new perspective of looking at life uh, when you have this information, right? Um, yes. And I think it's uh, fascinating because it's, it's, 
Um, I think it was the Apostle Paul who said this to be in the world without being of the world. Right. So you you have this new new perspective when you understand that life goes on and you you live in the same world, but you look at things very differently. Um, and so how do we make sense of all of that now that we know the life goes on? Right. One of the things that uh, that I'm always asked, for instance, Roberta, is um, are you guys always doing mediumship? Are you guys always talking about? Uh, you know, uh, the survivability of the soul in your events. And you say, yes, we talk about it, but because we feel like we have satisfied our curiosity with the fact that life goes on, we yes. tend not to focus too much on trying to show to people that it does, right? Um, it feels like we've cleared that hurdle and now we're asking ourselves the next question, which is, all right, it does. So what does that mean? And how do I change the way I am so I can be happier, right? And prepare to, to live in this, this new reality. With spiritualism is much more, in my experience, um, sort of grounded in the first part of the 20th century. Um, but I have spoken at spiritual. At, I love the spiritualists. I've spoken at their churches. They always have mediums there giving messages to uh, people in the audience from their loved ones. Um, but they sing from hymnals, slightly changed. Standard hymns, Christian hymns, mm -hmm. it's very much more Christian than what you're talking about. Um, and I, so whenever I go, I always sort of feel frozen in time 100 years mm -hmm. ago, kind of. But what you're saying is you're, you're looking so far into the future. Whatever's happening is what you want to know because it enforces what you're all doing together. I mean, you're not, you're, I mean, if you're doing rescue work, that's pretty cutting edge as far as I'm concerned. Many people, so most people still don't have any idea of how important that is and how many people need rescuing. Indeed, indeed. And that's, uh, I think that's one of the, because, uh, um, you know, spiritism has a very practical aspect to it that we try to remind ourselves that we are here to grow, but also help others grow. Um, and we feel like we understand this interaction between between worlds because of our scientific based mindset uh, very well. And because of that, we have come in contact with spirits who um, who who are not necessarily happy. Right. And so and making helping them make sure that they know what's happening and what's ahead and that this rescue work that goes with it. It's a central part of spiritism because, you know, I jokingly say this all the time, but it is true. It's hard to have spiritism without spirits, right? So, uh, <laughs> yes, but 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 you wouldn't have a medium there giving messages, or would you, to people love, from loved ones? Does that happen too? It, it's it's possible, but it's more and more unlikely that you find that in a group uh -huh. um, because mediumship is is such a delicate thing in itself, right? Uh, it uh, is. Yeah. So it's it's it, it is it we some of the groups do that, but oftentimes. Uh, uh, the mediums themselves are, are are still struggling with their own perception of was this really a message or not, and and exposing them in public uh, sometimes makes it hard for them to to develop their own mediumship. That's so right. in, in, within yeah. the spiritist perspective, we try to do it as a team effort. So we generally have private meetings where a group that has been studying mediumship for a while uh, does the communications and uh, and the rescue work together. That's generally not open to the public. And so people who come to a spiritist group might not necessarily encounter the mediumistic phenomena, you know, on display, if that makes sense. It's more about what we what we've learned from communicating with mediums about rea uh, with spirits through mediums about reality, about um, the process, about how to live, about the process of life. Yes. And then, OK, yes. I, I, totally, yes. I think what you're doing is great. Yes. I, wish, and I wish everybody knew about it. Yeah, and if I may, I think that you, you hit on something really important there. I think the reason why we do that, too, is because we also want to empower people to have the knowledge and grow, you know, in knowledge and understanding themselves. Yes. And we are very wary sometimes of creating a dependency relationship between somebody who is going to a medium for answers, right? That's I think that would, be, that would be an unhealthy relationship if you think that every time you have a problem, you need to go seek a medium to give you answers. I think that's not a healthy relationship. I don't think that's what we're here for. No, you're absolutely right. Well, this is exciting to me. I feel as if I've met a whole group of kindred spirits. Um, I Pardon the pun, um, uh, because I, I guess I didn't realize the extent to which you were sort of doing a, on a parallel track the same kinds of things we're doing here. So I think that's just wonderful. So Isn't it? Talk, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's because, you, as you pointed out, um, Spirit does tell us that they're working in many different areas all around the world all the time, and we find this more and more also. 
we come together and we complete each other's sentences, which is to me a very thrilling thing. But talk about what, for example, what would someone encounter at the conference this year? By the way, I should just say briefly, it's going to be June 6th, 2020 in Berkeley, California, but probably on the East Coast next year and maybe the West Coast again the year after. You do you, you do move around every year, I've noticed. Indeed, we try to do that to make it accessible to folks in general. Um, yes, I think that, uh, um, let, me, let me just go back and say, Roberta, that you were very excited, but not as excited as I am. I absolutely love to run into people who have not necessarily been exposed to spiritism by, but hold very similar perspectives. I think that just proof that, you know, we all work for the same boss. We're just in different parts. Right? Oh, from your mouth to God's ears, exactly yeah. right. So, um, so uh, for example, what, what would be, what, what are some of the things on, on the uh, program for the, for this conference? Yes. Um, so, so, you know, in the morning we'll probably have, uh, we generally have a, you know, welcome, uh, initial prayer. We do do a prayer. Uh, often we believe in the importance of focusing on mind and asking for guidance and especially from our discarnate friends. Uh, we call discarnate the, the, you know, the spirits who are no longer in a physical body, but who are also with us. Uh, we generally have an artistic presentation. Then we will have a series of different talks. We're going to talk about the evolution of religious thinking. We're going to talk about uh, spiritual and intellectual growth of humanity. We're going to talk about the role of spirituality in our everyday life. We're going to have a roundtable on the visible and invisible world and how do they come together. Um, we are going to have different presentations. We're going to have some youth education programming as well. Um, and we're going to have one of my favorite sessions uh, which is uh, uh, it's called a Spiritist Conversation. And we're going to just get a group of people. I'm going to have the pleasure of moderating that one. And we're just going to ask folks, how does technology and spirituality come together, if at all? Um, and we're going to do that in an unscripted fashion. We want to make sure that uh, it's really a conversation because sometimes, you know, conferences and symposiums can kind of be stiffy. Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, it's a real uh, applicable thing to everybody. So it's it's in for intents and purposes it's, it's almost like a, a conference that you would attend to for anything else. But the topics are going to be uh, spiritualist and uh, spiritual in nature. Yeah. Um, and I should just point out: don't you charge like twenty five or thirty five dollars, something like that, for the day? Yes, I think that's fantastic. Yes. We do, we do. We, um, you know, as you, one of the things that you're going to find in Spiritism is that we uh, we try to hold ourselves to a really high bar when it comes to uh, ethical standards. And we try to make it accessible because nobody gets paid for this, right? For spiritist practice, there's no uh, uh, payment for any of that stuff whatsoever. So we, we try to follow that, 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 that maxim that Christ left us with, which is, you know, freely give what freely you have received. Uh, but yes. we do charge 25 bucks because, hey, we have to pay for the venue, right? Um, oh, yes, yes. So, so, so yes, but then none of those speakers are getting paid to be there, which is something I think unique uh, to spiritism. We, we try to make, make that a labor of love. No, I think that's just beautiful. So if you were, if you were telling people uh, that you had, who didn't know what spiritual spiritism is, what, how would you sort of summarize it? It's, it looks to me to be a, 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 sort of an interactive with, with spirit way to live your life, to learn how to better, more perfectly live your life. Is that what it is? I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. How do, how would no. you describe it? No, I think I think you're you're I think you're there, Robert. I think that uh, different spiritists might give you different meanings because there isn't a centralized you know spiritist body out there that tells you what spiritism is. But I would say that it's this body of knowledge that really helps you uh, you know pursue the idea of uh, where do you come from? What are you really? Are you a physical body? Are you a spiritual uh, being? And what does that mean to you? And what's going to happen to you? future so it's i think it's this ongoing and dynamic progressive body of knowledge that concerns itself with who we are as spiritual beings and uh, what's ahead of us and and by consequence how to deal with the world that we live in right uh, if there is this other world then how do we live in this world this one here too but you're also studying the words of jesus which is very important very few christians actually study the words of jesus and you're trying to live by them Indeed, indeed, because uh, I think that once you're able to pierce that veil of organized religion and yes. really go back to Jesus, uh, the incredible moral leader that he was, 
Yes. Uh, this, is, this is free to something I struggle with when I was a kid, right? I was raised in Catholic schools and I wasn't necessarily the easiest kid to be, you know, to, uh, <laughs> Because I would just ask why all the time, right? It did not make my teachers very happy, right? No, uh, right. The whole idea of like it is because it is a dogmatic approach, it just didn't settle with me. Um, so I think that with, with spiritism, once you are able to kind of uh, pierce that veil that we were talking about of, of organized religion and go back and you really begin to understand, you know, spirit communication and reincarnation and how – even the holy, so-called holy books came to be, right? The 27 books in the New Testament and the Council yes. of Nicaea and everything else. You start to think about it and say, you know what? There's a lot more here than meets the eye. So I personally, um, uh, one of the books that I want to work on, I haven't started just yet. It would be like the kidnapping of Jesus. Uh, you know, I think that Jesus has been kidnapped a little bit, uh, his idea. And then yes. we can just kind of break that down and go back to the, to the, to the meaning and to the origin of things. Yes. Um, my, my book, Liberating Jesus, is – the same kind of thing. I mean, oh my goodness! <laughs> I didn't know you had a, a liberating Jesus book. Is that so? Yeah. Go to robertagrimes.com. It's right there. I'll send it to you in PDF if you like. But but yes, um, I think that this. What excites me about this, frankly, I, I think you're delightful. Number one, and I felt the same way about Jasara. But the the fact that you are working so parallel with what a number of people that I know are doing. It's as if this is a groundswell and it's quite a remarkable one. So um, we'll be be doing this again, having other conversations. Once you have your book about Paul ready to come out, I'll have you back to talk about that. I mean, I'm not a fan of any part of the book except the Gospels uh, of the Bible, but as I mean, if if you talk the way you talk now, and you're writing about Paul, I want to I want to have you back to just just say what it you is what it is you have to say. So we'll we'll do that. Um, I hate to say that we're coming to the end of our time. It would, what what do you want people most to take away from from what what we've said today? Um, I think that uh, what really uh, would make me happy is for folks to understand and and let that sink in that uh, that you know that we are. We are more than our physical bodies, that we transcend what we seem to be and that we are so fortunate that God loves us so much as to make sure that we would never stop being. Um, And in the same sense, once we start kind of unfolding that idea a little bit, uh, you know, and we realize that we have lived previous lives and we will live uh, more lives in our future as we strive to better ourselves and help others do the same. We make an incredible amount of friends along the way, friends in this lifetime that follow us into next lifetimes and friends who maybe we don't remember, but who are also cheering for us on the other side. So, oh, absolutely uh, right. That's so true. So um, if you want not, to learn more, more spiritist.us, is that your main website, right? That is true. That is the, 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 the website for the Spiritist Federation here in the U.S. And then there is spiritistsymposium.org, um, which is which talks about the symposium you're about to have in June, in June 6th, 2020. And the, the price is right, and I think the ideas are probably going to be perfectly right on and fascinating for anybody who, who listens to, to Seek Reality. These are kindred spirits. And if you go, I'd love to hear from you how it was, because maybe I'll go next year. Um, I think this is great. So... Please consider yourself hugged, my dear, now, really for real, Dan, because I think you're, you're doing a wonderful job. I'm so glad to know you and to know what you all are up to. Right back at you. And thank you so much for having me, Roberta. It's a pleasure to uh, um, you know, talk to you and learn more about what you've been doing. And I know what my next book's going to be. I had to go back there and uh, buy a liberating Jesus and, and take her. <laughs> Everyone, we are so glad you were with us today. This has been Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes, and I frankly, I'm blown away. I knew spiritism was something I wanted to learn more about, but I think it's a, it, it's a, a very, very important movement. Everyone, please never forget that you are a powerful, eternal being. You never began and you never will end, and when you really get what that means, it's going to change everything in your life for the better. Next week, our guest will be Dr. Betty J. Kovach. 
Benny is the author of Merchants of Light, the consciousness, consciousness, easy word to say, that is changing the world. No less a light in this field than Dr. Larry Dossie says, this splendid book is a tour de force, an infusion of wisdom capable of changing the direction and fate of our species. He tends to kind of get a little hyperbolic. The great Dr. Irvin Laszlo and many others actually have also praised this book. And frankly, I admire Dr. Dr. Kovach for the phenomenal effort it must have taken just to trace the awareness of an underlying or cosmic consciousness from prehistory to today. I think you're going to love this next week, so I hope you'll join us. And with us today has been Dr. Daniel Assisi, who is a founding member of the Spiritist Institute and the current executive director of the California Spiritist Association. As you can hear, Spiritism which has been going on since the 19th century, is a spiritual movement for today. It's for those who are no longer able to accept the most fear-based Christian dogmas, but still want to follow Jesus, and to be part of a familiar feeling kind of spiritual movement that has a home where they can go and meet with others. Um, If you want to learn more about Spiritism, go to spiritist.us, and I, frankly, I think it makes sense to just find a Spiritist meeting in your area and just go. Because apparently they'll be happy if you show up. And I think I'm going to try that too. The Spiritist Symposium, an annual event, is going to happen this year, 2020, June 6th, in Berkeley, California. Just go to spiritistsymposium.org and you can learn all about it. Now, as you know, my nonfiction books are Liberating Jesus, My Thomas, The Fun of Dying, The Fun of Staying in Touch, The Fun of Growing Forever, The Fun of Living Together, and very soon now, The Fun of Loving Jesus, Embracing the Christianity that Jesus Taught. For young children, there's The Fun of Meeting Jesus, and sometime this year, we're hoping to put out The Fun of Growing with Jesus. We have the illustrations. I just need to find the time. All my books are available through bookstores or on Amazon.com, and all the adult books are also available as audiobooks. If you want to talk to me, if you want to talk about any of my books or really about anything at all, you can always contact me through the contact block on robertagrimes.com. I do answer emails. It takes me a few days to get to them because uh, right now I'm getting quite a lot of them. But I, it's important to me that if you want to talk to me, I'll be here for you. Just be sure to give me your correct email address because I hate it when they bounce. Past episodes of Seek Reality are available on webtalkradio.net, on realrevolutionradio.com, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and many other stations, including those in the wonderful Dream Vision 7 radio family. More and more people are telling me now that they listen through the Seek Reality app, which is available for free in the iTunes app store. So if You know, if you'd like, you can just get that and be done with it. And if you ever wonder where Seek Reality can be heard right now, just go to robertagrimes.com and click on the radio tab. If you enjoy these weekly conversations, you might also want to check out my blog at robertagrimes.com. I use my blog post to work out in greater detail some of the issues that we talk about on Seek Reality. There's more space, and it's a place where we can all talk about it because we get many comments, and it's a discussion. We have a lot of fun with it. So please check us out if it interests you. Meanwhile, this has been Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. Please enjoy, please make the most of this coming week in our one reality, knowing that you are a powerful, eternal being, and you, in particular, most of all, are infinitely loved. You've been listening to Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. Roberta blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Join us every week as we explore what the afterlife evidence and modern science combine to tell us is true about the one reality we all share. Knowing the truth changes everything.